All right, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Take Another Look, where we're teaching the book of Revelation verse by verse for over three years now, and we are in starting chapter 20 today. Good morning, uh, Tenderheart. Um, Miss Anna is one of our paraprofessionals. She is a blessing to WBSU and to others who are chiming in, even as we speak. And I want to say that, as you notice, the sign behind my head, although I can't uh, get all the way out of the way, class of uh, 2020, um, we just had our graduation uh, for WBSU. We graduated uh, 75 uh, students who moved, who graduated with their either their bachelor, their ma associate or master degree. We have had a few master degree professors who graduated, and we had a, a couple of doctorate uh, degrees that, of, of a professor and a paraprofessional that graduated. So a lot went on this last weekend. Uh, it is on my Facebook timeline. Be sure to watch if you can. All right. Uh, we are going to continue today as I'm sharing with you uh, lessons from what I believe Holy Spirit is showing me, has shown me, and is showing me as we continue this spiritual journey through the book of Revelation verse by verse. And as I always say for sake of the video, just in case you this is the first and only video you see, if you're joining me for the first time, we're looking at the events surrounding the Apostle John as he experiences a new dimension of the heavenly realms of the Father's mind. And we're seeing what we can learn from his experience. So keep in mind that I'm teaching this completely from the idea that the book of Revelation is the revelation or the unveiling of the anointed one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, again, thank you, everybody, for joining me. Uh, David Jacobs, our board member, Dr. Fay, who is watching, and others this morning. Now, <clears throat> I want to just say this, that how I define revelation is the unveiling of the Father's heart. That is the whole point of the book of Revelation is an unveiling. And this unveiling uh, is so important because this unveiling happens in a people and particularly in the soul of mankind. And that's the essence of what is happening in the book of Revelation. So let's continue to see what John sees next and hears next as he shows us how to operate from a heavenly realm uh, while ministering here in this earthly realm. So we don't have to be limited by what we see, what we hear, what we uh, feel and etc., but that we are unlimited in the truth of the, what the Father says about us. So let's continue now with Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, 2, and 3. We'll get as much of verse 2 and 3 as we can, and then probably have to come back to this next week. So uh, let's get started. All right, Revelation 20, verse 1, 2, and 3 from the New King James says, Then I saw an angel or we know that this is translated heavenly messenger, coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished, but after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, the wording of the New King James, uh, as well as the wording of the King James and other similar translations, really have given us a poor translation of the original language. So while I cannot give you a word by word play of the original language, still there are things that needs to be seen. So <clears throat> when you look at the New King James Version of the Bible, for example, if that's the version of the Bible you have, and uh, you read the, um, the, the headings. Now, keep in mind that passage headings, uh, chapter headings or passage headings were added by the translators, um, by the printers uh, to kind of section out the, the, the scripture to give people an idea of what they're talking about. The reality is, is that in this case, 
Uh, there's something misleading about the title in the heading of this section of scripture uh, from just about any translation of the Bible. Uh, we will see, uh, we often see a passage heading that reads something like we see in the New King James or the King James, which says Satan bound 1,000 years. However, this does not prove a conducive, uh, uh, provide a conducive understanding that lines up with the proper interpretive lens of all scripture, which is Father's unconditional love for his creation. So there must be something more to this school of thought. And that's what we're investigating today. Now, as we look at this, uh, John starts out and he says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Uh, once again, to keep a proper perspective in line with previous lessons, the word angel does not uh, refer to a white being with wings that is flying around in the heavenly spiritual unseen realm of spirit. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos. Angelos, which is defined as to bring tidings or a messenger. The, the messenger uh, that we're referring to here, this heavenly messenger, would then refer to a spirit being that is not visible in this natural realm, but is manifested in the realm of the supernatural. So I'm going to describe that for you today and, and talk about this with some, some uh, great explanation. So here John saw this messenger coming down from heaven. So let's look at this verse one very carefully because the phrase coming down. Now, the phrase is this two word uh, phrase coming down is from the Greek words katabai, katabaino, katabaino, uh, meaning to descend or referring to celestial beings from the unseen realm manifesting among or with us, uh, actually within us. Uh, we don't see them with our natural eyes, not that it's impossible to see with our natural eyes, but spirit beings are usually seen by spirit, not with natural eyes. So when we see into the spirit, it's not our natural eyes that are seeing, but it is spirit eyes, so the eyes of our spirit. And John saw this heavenly messenger having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Keep in mind that uh, we have just seen in the previous few chapters, the Babylonian system within man's soul uh, come to an end, followed by the marriage supper, where the union or reunion of mankind's thinking is joined to the mind of God. And that's what takes place now. I want to read something to you. It's a little bit lengthy, but it will be pertinent to uh, the rest of this lesson. And so if you would just listen to this story, uh, because J. Preston Eby relates this story in his commentary that he once read, and I thought it was very pertinent. And he says, I, I once read a story uh, uh, stemming from the Middle Ages, at which time the Christians were in control of Jerusalem. Being in control of Jerusalem, the Christians thought it would be appropriate for them to banish the Jews from the city. So they tried various methods until finally they decided that they would get the Pope to come to talk with uh, talk them into leaving. So as it was, this uh, the arrangements were made for the Pope to come and debate with uh, uh, for a debate with the head rabbi. All of the cardinals came with the Pope and all of the rabbi's assistants attended with their leader. As the debate began, the Pope and the rabbi agreed that it would be best to meet alone. So uh, all of their advisors left. However, the Pope couldn't speak Yiddish and the rabbi couldn't speak the Pope's language. So they communicated by using hand signals. The Pope began his discourse by moving his arms in a big circle. Then the rabbi responded by pointing to the ground. Immediately following that, the Pope held up three fingers, to which the rabbi responded by holding up one finger. To that, the Pope full, uh, pulled out a chalice and held it up, at which the rabbi pulled out his robe, uh, of, from his robe an apple and held it up high. Seeing all this, the rabbi threw up his arms uh, in the air and concluded, uh, 
and uh, threw up his arms in, in the air and concluded the Jews stay. The cardinals overheard the, uh, the verdict, ran into the chambers and pulled the Pope aside. They requested the details of the debate. Why had he allowed the Jews to stay? The Pope said that to them, I threw up my arms in a big circle to say God is everywhere. The rabbi responded by pointing to the ground to say that I was right, but God is also here. I then held up three fingers saying that God is three persons. The rabbi pointed, uh, uh, responded holding up one finger, clarifying that God is also one person. At that, I pulled out my chalice to share with him the idea that we believe in the blood of Christ as our grace and our union with God. He then pulled out an apple referring to the original sin of, apple, of Adam and all the people have sinned and fallen short of the glory and therefore we are equal in the sight of God, meaning that by this that the Jews would stay. The rabbi's council also had come into the meeting. They asked their leader to explain what had been said in the debate. The rabbi obliged, uh, obligate, uh, obliged them saying, the Pope swept his arms in a circle saying that we must all leave. I pointed to the ground saying that we would not, we would stay because this is our homeland. So he threw up, held up three fingers indicating that he would give us three days to get out. I held up one finger and said to, that it was the Christians who had but one day to leave. At this, he grabbed his chalice and began eating his lunch. So I took out my apple. The story seems to illustrate, so, so that, that's kind of the story. Now, for me, the story seems to illustrate the truth that if you interpret what you see and hear about the great things of God with a natural understanding or AKA the carnal mind, you will miss the point altogether. Now, most uh, Christians seem to arrive at wrong interpretations of scripture by using some form of illogical conclusion or coming to some form of illogical conclusion. And this is what happens when the, we look at the book of Revelation and when it's interpreted by the literalness of written scripture as opposed to seeing uh, the scriptural and symbolic truth of, of uh, a truth John wrote in his vision. So what exactly is John seeing? What exactly is John uh, saying? And what is he seeing in this heavenly, uh, this, this, uh, heavenly message um, as this heavenly messenger manifests in John's vision? Well, let's look back at John uh, Revelation 20, verse 1, and let's read it this time from the Amplified Bible, and it says this. It says, and then I saw an angel descending from heaven, holding the key uh, to the abyss, the bottomless pit, and a great chain was, it was in his hand. So the translations are very similar in their wording. Commentary says the Greek words for, uh, and I saw, are used seven times in chapter 19 through 21 to indicate a progression at the end of time from the marriage supper of the Lamb to the millennium uh, to, uh, uh, to the new heaven and new earth. Now, the phrase end time is not speaking of the end time. It's speaking of the end of a period of time. As John sees an end to the soulish control of mankind, uh, that ha uh, mankind has encountered all of his natural or carnal days uh, in, in his natural mindedness. So because we will see how that the end that the entering of a millennial reign or a new millennium, uh, not a millennial reign, but a new millennium of the heaven and the earth is simply mankind realizing that they are the new heaven and the new earth or the heavenly Jerusalem. The Bible says in Matthew that you are a city set on a hill and that cannot be hidden. The word city there actually is translated heavenly Jerusalem. And so you are the new heaven and the new earth. You are the new, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. This level of thinking, however, requires that we embrace the mind of Father God who created us as rulers over all things. You know, a lot of people don't believe that we are rulers. They believe that someday we will become rulers. You know, and I, I, I get that. 
I was raised in that belief system also, that one day we would be victorious, one day we would overcome, one day, someday, far off in the future, we would rule and we would come back and rule with Christ. But what we're talking about here is something that is, not something that will be. Um, so uh, we are to rule as gods, lowercase g, just as Father God, uppercase g, would rule, and we are were not designed to be ruled by any form of darkness. Now, I'm not talking about a demon or a devil or some something like that. I'm just telling you that we were not created to be ruled by any darkness. Darkness can be uh, defined as um, a, a, a uh, is a lack of light or a lack of understanding. Right? Amen. Okay. So it is said that uh, uh, to understand how a machine works one must understand the most detailed structures of its inner systems. The same understanding is required uh, of the original scriptures, the Greek and Hebrew, and we can acquire that understanding if we'll just apply ourselves and study. Uh, and and from that's from where, where we must uh, 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 see most from most of our modern Bibles, uh, which were unfortunately tr uh, translated from. And as they were translated from the original languages, languages changed, meanings changed, and now we have a translation of the Bible or translations of the Bible, as it were, that are translated incorrectly. And I say that with all respect for the scriptures. I love the scriptures. I love the Bible. I, I just believe that there is a much of a mistranslation, which gives us a wrong concept in our modern world of what it really says. Let's look at uh, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18 from the Passion Translation. It says this. Paul said, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation or the spirit of discovery, and that's what we're after, uh, to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. I pray that the light of God will illuminate your eyes, the eyes of your imagination or your innermost heart or your deep, a, a deep knowing flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us, his holy ones. Let me say this about this passage, that Paul is not praying for you as an entire being or you as spirit to get an awakening. He's talking about your, your carnal mind. Remember, James gave us a clue that said we saw into the perfect law of liberty, but we looked away and forgot what kind of man we, we were. This is a biblical clue. There's a lot of clues throughout scripture that tell us about eternity past. We come into this natural realm, we become visible as it were, and we forget who we were created to be. And so Paul prays that the eyes of their understanding or their, that they would be illuminated with God's mind uh, to think as he thinks. Writer and commentator J. Preston E.B. says, when men earnestly seek the face of the Lord, he raises up within them his Holy Spirit to dispel the darkness of the natural mind that ever hangs a, sh uh, that ever hangs a, uh, as a shroud over them that he may reveal to our spiritual minds the things that pertain to the higher realm of his kingdom. Let me pause there and say, when we talk about the, the natural mind versus the spiritual mind, we're not talking about spirit and soul. We're talking about the, the renewed and the unrenewed portions of your soul. One has a spiritual take on things. One has a natural or a carnal take on things. It is all a matter, it, it all matters of, in all matters of revelation and spiritual understanding, it is po impossible to overestimate uh, the importance of the spirit who takes us, who comes to take the things of God and show them to us. Two worlds, indeed, two realms exist all about uh, what, uh, all about us and within us, the natural world and the spiritual world. The natural realm is the realm of man, but the spiritual realm is the realm of God. The natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolish just to him. Neither can he know them or explain them, for they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Can we not see by this that the explanations of the carnal mind about the spiritual meanings of scripture would 
uh, as do many of the popular church teachings today, uh, sound just as ridiculous and absurd as the Pope's explanation of the rabbi's hand signals, which is why I wanted to read that story to you. Now, uh, let me just say this to kind of pull everything together to this point. Ephesians 4, verse 4, 5, and 6 in the Passion Translation says, being one body and one spirit, you are all called unto the same, you were all called, you were past tense, all called to the same uh, glorious hope of divine destiny. For the Lord God is one, and so are we. We share in one faith, one baptism, and one father. He is the perfect father who leads us all, works through us all, and lives in us all. And let me just say this, it's very important at this point and in this scripture that you keep an open mind to the fact that when Paul was writing and they read these in these cities, in these congregations, which were not always behind closed doors, oftentimes there were Jews present because they were targeting these young uh, Jewish believers. And there were Gentiles present who sometimes that was the target. But there were also people who the Jews would classify as heathen. Uh, who also were listening. And so Paul is getting a message across by saying, this perfect father, he leads us all, works to us all, and lives in us all. So uh, even though we see one realm, okay, uh, just as we see the eternal Christ, uh, we uh, just as we see one eternal Christ, one Holy Spirit, and one father of us all, still we view a natural world or a natural realm one way, and yet we see a spiritual realm another way. We are a part of both of these views or awarenesses, okay? I mean, uh, we are. So I'm looking at a, a computer screen right now. I have three 24-inch monitors in front of me, and I'm looking at a computer screen right now, which is in this natural realm of awareness. But beyond that, there's all of you who are listening and watching this program today. Now, I want to say this to you, that I think why Paul has said that he prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be uh, the eyes of your uh, uh, understanding or the eyes of your heart be enlightened, uh, which could also read the light of, of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination. To understand the realm of God or the realm of spirit, it does take the illumination of supernatural sightedness of one's imagination. Uh, uh, imagination is not just a natural carnal thing that we imagine or fantasize about things that are uh, are untrue or will never happen to us. But there is spiritual imagination where we view the scriptures. We look into the realm of God. We view our natural Bibles. We read from them. We take the, the Greek and the Hebrew from Strong's and Thayer's, which was written about 1800 years after the first century. And we kind of uh, take all the pieces of information and we run some history. We, we Google some history. We do some research. And then the Holy Spirit takes all of that beyond our natural perspective or our natural ability to study. And we go beyond that into our supernatural imagination. And the Holy Spirit puts all the pieces together. So uh, the, the word imagination is defined as the faculty or action of forming new ideas or images or concepts of external objects not present to the senses. So imagination goes beyond the senses, right? So it seems that if some in the first century were confused, uh, it, it seems, yeah, uh, as it seems as if some in the first century were confused about the teachings of Jesus versus the demands of the law. And the demands of the law were heavy when it comes to those first century Jews. Uh, the demands of the Pharisees, the demands of the Roman government, uh, who uh, really were um, uh, so powerful uh, in influence. And uh, it's very important that we understand that um, these influences were a big deal to them, okay? I mean, literally. Uh, and, and so as we look at this, uh, when we consider the writings of the book of Revelation, now hear this, um, as the beast known as Roman emperors made strict rules about who would bow to their authority, uh, we see that in a, 
in a comparative light in our modern world how that some have become confused about spiritual things because of the pressures around us who once have been active believers i want you to hear this yet now have begun to believe that we do not even need a bible at all to understand the spiritual world but now that the beast within mankind's mind, listen to this statement, the false prophets of the voice within and in, in an entire belief system of a Babylonian way of thinking that mankind was dependent upon were now destroyed. People were finding their way into a new or fresh way of believing. The fact is, is that we have these, 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 uh, these fresh revelations that really are the truth about us, uh, but we're coming into them literally because we didn't know them. So we're being awakened to the truth that always has been. And John sees this heavenly messenger manifesting in this vision to bring an additional unveiling of the eternal Christ within. Now, notice that this messenger has the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So we know that keys are used to lock and unlock things, right? We're not talking about binding and loosing. We're talking about locking and unlocking things. Now, metaphorically, a key is an answer or a means or an instrument used to find the secret of or remedy for a problem or situation, right? Okay, so keys are important, even supernatural or spiritual keys or uh, things when it comes to scripture. Uh, so some might say, I found the key to success. Or some might say, I found the key to overcoming disease. Or some might say, I have the keys or understanding of the kingdom of God. We call them keys. However, in this case, the key seems to be that the messenger uh, has delivered or unveiled truth, which brings an awakening to unlock fresh supernatural revelation that exposed an old way of thinking. What does it do? Does it say, look how bad the past was? No, it exposes that what you have learned in the past was not a real and true or proper understanding of truth. So now how that darkness, that lack of understanding is dispelled is by introducing fresh light, right? Okay. And so when the mind is released through the power of revelation, old forms of living uh, have the light of truth that shine on them, exposing all areas of separation thinking so that we can live in the fullness of God. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, today, that is the point. That is the purpose, is to be exposed to uh, and to come into a place of living in the fullness of the Father's uh, mind. Revelation locks up every thought that opposes the truth about God and about his creation and releases the powers of reconciliation, which reconnects our memory to his mind. Amen. All right. So let's look at this now. We're going to go back to uh, Revelation 1, uh, back to Revelation 1, verse uh, 20. And we're going to look at this and we're going to... Uh, we're, we're going to see this from the King James Version now. Not a great deal of change in wordings, but I want you to see something. Uh, it says, and I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the keys of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. There is a difference, it seems, between the wording of the King James uh, and other like translations versus the Greek text uh, is that the angel or messenger carries uh, the chain on his hand rather than in his hand. Now, why is that significant? Well, listen to this. The word for in, uh, as used here in the Greek text, uh, is the Greek word epi, uh, meaning superimposition of time, place, order, and so on, as a relation of distribution, or in other words, over, or above. Now, sometimes the Greek text reading the definitions can seem a little bit confusing. So let's put this into perspective. The key that is in the messenger's hand, the chain, 
uh, however, is uh, as we see this, the chain is on the messenger's hand and seemingly wrapped around it. This is the picture that would be painted for us. So let's look at a brief comment by writer and commentator J. Preston Evey. He says, the chain signifies anything that prevail, uh, prevents free action. Error is sometimes called a chain. Love is a chain that holds its captives enslaved. Pride and tradition are also chains that make us slaves to custom. Uh, the law of our parents is said by scripture to be as a chain about our neck. In this case, the chain could be none uh, of these things, for it is held by a messenger signifying a strong and powerful word of the Lord. It can also be the living word of God's Christ. This is the word that shall cause the earth to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, as stated in Isaiah 11, verse 9. So let's keep in mind uh, that this messenger has the key to freedom and carries this chain for a specific purpose here in John's vision as he's seen this unfold. The chain signifies, this is the, what is again symbolic, signifies the supernatural ministry of the many-membered body of the one eternal Christ. But what is it for? What is the point? All right, well, we're going to cover this and we're going to get this nailed by the time we're done with this teaching today. So hang with us, okay? All right, now, <clears throat> in verse one, John sees a messenger come out of the heavenly realm or manifesting in his awareness, to his awareness. Now, generally the word come is the Greek word, word erkomai, which can be translated as to come and go as in to become visible and return to as a to as uh, uh, to its state of being invisible or in other words to manifest so why is this heavenly messenger manifesting uh, or why has he manifested in John's awareness holding a key and having a chain a great chain on his hand well revelation 20 verse 2 and 3 in the new king james says and he laid hold on of the dragon and so thus that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he would deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, uh, uh, he must be released for a little while. Now, we won't be able to understand all of this today, but we will be able to get a, a point of moving in a direction with this, this teaching. So if this chain is symbolic of preventing unrenewed thoughts from remaining free to uh, control the soul of mankind, and if they can prevent error from ruling within you, then this chain is designed to hold this great dragon from keeping you unrenewed to the revelation of truth. So the great dragon is a religious mindset, okay? Now, it has a lot of fingers that go out that we call different things, and we've talked about that in the past, and we'll talk about that more, but really that's what this great dragon is doing is, is a symbol. It is symbolic of keeping your unrenewed thoughts uh, bound uh, or away from the revelation of truth. So Christ and his many-membered body as one are positioned in the revelation of truth as well as the complete manifestation of the fullness of the eternal Christ manifesting within your individual understanding so that the whole may truly function as one. You understand that the person across from you, maybe in some other country or maybe on Facebook or maybe uh, someone you know that has, has really given you a lot of trouble, uh, you need Need to see that the goal of the the many membered body as one operating as the eternal Christ as he is so are we the purpose is is so that we can impact everybody around us whether we're releasing the vibrations of energy that flow out of us or what even in our prayers or in our declarings or whether we're speaking to them face to face and doing the same thing the purpose is so that the whole may truly function as one. Now, the thing to know that is this phrase, 
the devil and Satan are simply nicknames. We talked about this in chapter 12 and do not describe any form of a real supernatural entity. Too often people are giving credit to this supposed deity called Satan or the devil and almost viewing him in the exact same power um, at the exact, exact same power level as God. So God will get you out of trouble. The devil will put you in trouble. God will get you out of trouble. The devil will put you in. I want you to understand that God is positioned, okay? Not moving, okay? This other thing that we call an entity is not an entity at all. It is a mindset. So let's watch this. Uh, the devil is not real as far as a being, uh, as far as being a creature or being uh, uh, a being of some sort. The devil is, are you ready for this? I'm going to even give you the Greek on this. We're going to define this for you. The devil is, <laughs> you ready for this? The devil is unrenewed thoughts that attempt to traduce or invoke bad or wrong thinking within you. Amen? <laughs> okay, now let's, let's break this down. The word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, meaning to a, a traducer, a false accuser, or slanderer. Do you know where people have trouble? They don't have trouble because someone's whispering in their natural ear. They don't have trouble because uh, there's somebody standing in front of them telling them bad things. It might be a natural experience in some cases, but the trouble is in your unrenewed thoughts. So we have trouble in our thoughts. That's why people go to psychologists, go to counseling, is because they can't get a handle on their thinking, right? I've never had anybody come before me in over in about 40 years of pastoring when I did pastor uh, uh in out of these 48 years of ministry, never had anybody come to me and said, I'm having trouble with the devil. Uh, would you help me to understand that? I never did. People would say, I'm having trouble with my thoughts. Amen. Okay. So to, to, the word traduce means to speak badly of or tell lies about someone as uh, so as to damage their reputation. Now, can a person out there speak bad of me and damage my reputation. I want to tell you people have tried. You cannot be in a ministry where you are involved in this, the spotlight around the world and somebody not say bad things or try to discredit you. It has happened. But the fact is, if I don't let it in here, not in here, but in my soul, if I don't let it in here, it cannot move me. Amen. So we need to understand that that it's all about what I choose to believe or choose to think in my, in my mind. The word Satan comes from the Greek word satanas. I don't know whether you knew that or not, but this is where this Greek word comes from, satanas, uh, and is of an Aramaic origin, which is, and remember the Aramaic language later replaced the Hebrew language of the Old Testament. And there is the, the Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament, all of those things, but it's of Aramaic origin, which is pronounced, which we say S-A-T-A-N, but it's actually pronounced in the Aramaic Satan. It's not even Satan like we say it in our English language or our English culture. It is Satan and means the accuser and points back to the devil in its definition. So now we're right back to the traducer, one who traduces, who is a false accuser, who is a slanderer speaking bad of you, but it's happening in your own thinking. Now, many people want to believe in a devil for many reasons, some of which is to have someone to blame when things go wrong in life, okay? You know, there's a book uh, that Years ago, funeral homes were sending out to pastors and to clergy all over the place, and it was called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. Uh, the fact is, is that bad things happen to good people simply because people, uh, because they're just some stuff that happens in life. But it's how you think of it, how you perceive it, that makes the difference, right? It's very important that we get that. It's very important that we understand that. Amen? Uh, it's very important. And so uh, the reality is, is that when we talk about uh, this devil, uh, there are people who want to believe in a devil just to have somebody to blame in life, right? Well, the thing is this, that 
in all my years as a believer in Christ, I never had a battle with some devil, but I've certainly had many battles with my own thoughts. So if, if this reference to a devil is simply the battle of the unrenewed mind, then it should be obvious by now to a lot of people, to any spiritual minded individual, that this Satan is often referred to as spirit right isn't that right well let's now jump to another word the word spirit the word spirit is the greek word pneuma pneuma it almost looks like nyuma but it's pneuma meaning breath okay that's the first word now there are people who say only consider the first word uh, for me i'm not 100 percent convinced about about that because sometimes there's metaphors, there's there's typologies, there's ways words are used, but it means breath or blast or a breeze by analogy or figuratively a spirit. In essence, here it is, human rational soul by implication or the vital principle, mental disposition and etc. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, pneuma is used for Holy Spirit used for our spirit, but also is used for the human rational soul. So while there are several applications of the word spirit, the context here implies that the beast, uh, the, the best use of the word would be the human rational soul or a mind, or we could actually say a mindset. Now, remember in the context, uh, re remember the context, not only here, but in the entire book of Revelation, which is the unveiling or revealing of the anointed one within. So in other words, that which has been uh, and is being unveiled is the true thoughts of the father's mind within. Let's go back to Revelation 20, verse 2 and 3 from the Passion Translation now. And it says, he, referring to the messenger who is uh, the many-membered body of the one. Because when you're reading what John is seeing, remember, John is just one of the many-membered bodies of the one. Uh, member many body, body of the one. Remember that John also is a part of us and we're all a part of the eternal Christ. So we're just talking about one. So whatever's going on with Christ is going on with us. Whatever was going on with John is going on with us. So there was an unveiling, a revelation, a revealing coming to John. And, and so uh, here's what it says, that he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent known as the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. The mighty angel threw him into the pit locked it and sealed it so that he could no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were over. And after that, he must be loosed for a brief time. All right. Now, while the, there is significance to this statement, we must maintain that this book was sent and signified, Revelation 1 verse 1, sent and signified Samayo, uh, say myo, say, say myno, rather, say myno, which ultimately means to give as a sign or symbol. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing of how I came up with this definition of say, say myno and how it means to a, a symbolic language in the Old Testament and New Testament both confirm that in the Hebrew and Greek. Uh, but I would just say this, that this statement, that ancient serpent is a reference to the garden of, uh, uh, in Genesis chapter three, at this at that time, the Hebrew language even indicates that this serpent speaking to Eve indicates a voice within Eve's mind, but not a literal serpent or snake. Now, here in Revelation twenty verse two, this Satan has been bound within the soul of mankind ever since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, at the place of the skull. Uh, in addition to the judgment that took place uh, a, 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 on the hill called Golgotha, a, in the Greek language, uh, the term a thousand years is obviously a metaphor of a symbolic period of time such as referred to in 2 Peter 3.8. And I want to read this just to give us this this uh, this picture of time. Uh, Peter, Second Peter 3, 8, New King James, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, 
one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So it is not a thousand years, but as a thousand years. I want you to pay attention to that wording. It's not a thousand years, but it is as a thousand years. So we're going to come back to this next time as we see how you are positioned in the Father's authority as one who walks in the uh, the, the dominion you were created with. Uh, we're going to look at how that you live in the overcoming power of the Father's mind. Uh, you are not one who was created to be overcome by anything, as I stated at the beginning of this lesson. You were created in the light of as he is, so are you, in that you are as Jesus in this world, but also you are as God's lowercase g who mirror your creator God uppercase g. There's a hair width difference, but I want to, uh, to impart to you that we should respect that hair width difference because you are not God in terms of capital G, but you are a uh, hair width difference than your creator. So there is the creator creation aspect. There is the God versus God's aspect, but it's such a, a small difference that father God sees you the same as he sees himself. All I'm saying is you should see yourself the same as God sees you, but just respect the fact that he is creator and you are the creation. Amen. And so as we look at this, there is a dark pit within each person. We talked about this earlier, somewhere around chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there. We talked about the, the locusts that come out of the bottomless pit and described all of that being the, the dark regions of a person's unrenewed mind or unrenewed soul. Remember that the soul, uh, the suke, is the in the feminine form and the soul therefore as we talked about in chapter uh, 19 uh, is not defiled by the woman meaning that there is a part of the soul that is untouched by renew, unrenewed thinking hebrews 12 22 says but you have come to mount zion so where are we right now where are we positioned you have come to mount zion uh, and to the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem to an innumerable unmeasurable, unability to, uh, in a, uh, not having the ability to number company of angels or of messengers to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to spirits of just men made perfect. Look, folks, there is an awakening in the eternal Christ where unrenewed thinking is dissolved and can no longer trouble the nations of the soul. That's what's going on. That's what's happening. That's what we're awakening to, living life in an untroubled state of being. Oh my goodness, this is so good. Look, uh, you, as this new covenant remnant uh, of the eternal Christ continues to emerge and is unveiled to this generation around us, we're bringing healing and order to the chaos in God's creation, right? Amen. So we're going to have to, again, be willing to change, be willing to allow our thinking uh, of, of, of concerning who we are in the eternal Christ so that we'll not fall apart when the revelation of truth hits us, right? And 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 uh, uh, empowers this, this ability to change, right? Amen. So let me ask you again, we just started chapter 20 today. We're going to come right back to the same spot and then continue on from there next week. But I want to ask you this question. This is lesson number 100 and 63. Are you ready for what's next? Because once again, the thing that is next that I see will be for us to continue to, uh, to uh, 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 see this continuation of the transformation of old mindsets into the fresh and unveiled mindset of the Godhead, the fullness of God. Amen. God's got a new level of thinking for his people. That's why we teach the things we do. That's why my Tuesday show is uh, healed because God said so, but it's about changing mindsets. It's That's why my teaching on Wednesday about the book of Revelation is take another look because we're taking another look, seeing some new things, some things that we didn't get the first time around. But God's got a new level for us to start thinking like kings who operate out of the heavenly realm of spirit. Stick with me on this journey as we continue with more of the unveiling of the eternal Christ within you, the hope of glory to the world around us. Amen. It's time to embrace heaven's mindset right now 
in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time. Join me tomorrow night with Pastor Michelle Harding as we talk about some wonderful stuff uh, on Kingdom Dynamics. Friday morning as we finish up with Gil and uh, Adina Hodges. Uh, it's going to be good. I'll see you then. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.